Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. And I have a, a really interesting guy that, that a lot of you I know on YouTube and I don't think on any audio podcast have heard from. Uh, he was involved with the Grady crew and uh, Gambino family growing up. And as a young man, went in the witness protection program. Yeah. Sal Polisi. Sal Polisi, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Gary. All right. So I'm, I went. Did a little research on you. I don't even know how I found out about you. I, I, I don't. You're you're not like all over the place like Francis A. or Sammy the Bull is. So right, right. right. But I happened to stumble across you, and I started researching. I thought, well, this is an interesting guy that that I, nobody's ever heard from for a long time. And, and so I looked up on your IMDb. You've done a lot of things uh, in the uh, entertainment industry. I mean, a ton of them. Uh, but most importantly, back in the 80s, 1986, you were in the mob and you went in a witness protection program and you testified a few times. And and then uh, you had a book written about your life, Sins of the Father by Nick Taylor. Right. Uh, there was a ton of articles about you in a New Yorker magazine, uh, New York Times, Playboy. Uh, yeah. You've been on Larry King, Connie Chung and Matt Lauer shows. Uh, and that's just a few of them. Yeah, Charlie, Charlie Rose. I liked him. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, the, the infamous Charlie Rose now. <laughs> yeah, I was on with Charlie Rose and Matt Lauer. That means two of them have been excommunicated. <laughs> two of them at the hashtag B2 movement. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the kiss of death, man. <laughs> <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> you've, you've even done uh, uh, conferences with the U.S. Department of Justice, with police and colleges, FBI's. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell them a little bit. I guess you tell them about what it's what the mob's like. Uh, you've been certified in the federal court as a crime expert in the area of gambling, drugs and organized crime. Yeah. Uh, you've been out in Hollywood. You, you've got a book out there, the Sinatra Club, which we'll talk a little more about. Uh, you've done work with uh, in the, with the Raging Bull and and a ton of other things out there. So uh, I don't have a complete list of it. I, I'm sure you know a lot about what you've done. You, you've you written screenplays and you sold one. You told me a pretty funny story about how you put a Jewish name on one screenplay and then you sold it for a bunch of money years later and, and you didn't have your name on it. You didn't have Sal Polisi on it. That's right. That's right. Oh, well. Well, welcome, Sal. We're really uh, glad to have you here. You know, as I was looking, I thought, well, this is kind of doubly interesting for me because I was just researching on Sammy the Bull and and uh, what uh, how he got arrested out in the ecstasy case. And I was looking at it. I, I got into this whole thing about the first Gotti trial where they uh, used this uh, uh, Bosco guy. He was he was some kind of a Albanian, I think, and, uh, and and to bribe a juror. And and you testified in that trial, so. Uh, uh, and, and what I read was this Diane Giacalone, who was the, the first prosecutor that really went after Gotti, had you and wanted you just to talk about what it was like inside the Bergen Fish and Hunt Club back in those days. So so tell us a little bit about how you got into that life. Well, I had an uncle in the 60s that was friends, ironically, with Sonny Francis. Yeah. Uh. And Sonny would go to my uncle's motel in Queens, uh, right next to the Aqueduct Racetrack. And I was 20 years old, and I went on and hung out there at the motel and the bar, and they had gangsters, and they had uh, movers and shakers, and all kinds of people were in and out of that uh, you know, hotel bar. Well, then uh, my uncle started introducing me to the different guys in the mob, you know, because this was... The 1960s, everything was very quiet. Yeah. As I said to Charlie Rose on CBS Morning once, in the 60s, things were secretive. The mob was secretive. Baseball was secretive. Mm -hmm. Hollywood was secretive. And everybody kept secrets. And nobody spit out the laundry. Well, of course, you know all that changed. And eventually the mob started to get very public. But by the time the 70s came, and I had already gone to be about, let me think, around 25, 27 years old, I was a hijacker in New York City. Hijacker, I robbed banks. And it was a funny thing. I worked with a guy who later became pretty popular 
because Joe Pesci won an Academy Award for portraying him. His name was Tommy D. Simone. Yeah. And we robbed banks and hijacked trucks together. Well, the problem then, Gary, was that in those days, one family didn't associate with the others. And in 1972, there was a mob war on. So you couldn't just go out and offer another guy from another family an opportunity to rob a bank with you or rob a truck. You had to get permission. Uh. So I went to my my uh, capo guy and said, look, I want to rob with this guy, Tommy D. Simone, and this guy, Foxy. Tommy D. Simone is with Paul Vario, Lucchese, and Jimmy Burke, the guys from Goodfellas, of course. And then this guy, Foxy, was with Gambinos and uh, John Gotti. <laughs> and John Gotti had just came out of jail in the spring of 72. And I had opened up this little club and it was called the Sinatra Club because we put Sinatra records in a stolen jukebox. <laughs> and we played all the music. Cool. So little by little, Gotti, uh, you know, didn't have any money. We had to loan him 100 bucks to play poker. <laughs> And he said, I got friends with money. <laughs> Little did we know the friends he had with money, they were drug dealers. Because in those days, 72, nobody admitted you were a drug dealer. Yeah. The mob says, don't deal drugs. Well, most people thought, oh, wow, they got a nice line, the mob. Nobody deals drugs. That's a bunch of hogwash. You know why they didn't want you to deal the drugs down at the bottom of the ladder? Because the bosses were selling drugs. <laughs> That's why they didn't want competition. So anyway, through the Sinatra Club, uh, you know, we uh, pulled off a lot of heist. We got friendly. I was friendly with Gotti. And through 72, 73, you know, Gotti went and killed that guy in Staten Island, McBratney. Then in 74, I go to jail and John Gotti goes to jail. But before we go to jail, Gotti had killed that guy in Staten Island, and he hired an attorney named Roy Cohen. Oh, he, he hired Roy Cohen for that. I'd forgotten about that. Wow. Yeah, and I was, I was amazed because I was asked to take John Gotti, Angelo Ruggiero, and our attorney, we had the same attorney called Mike Coro, to a meeting with Roy Cohen, and I went to his townhouse, huh. and I listened to the fix. They made a fix that day. That John was going to take a plea, a manslaughter plea. He was going to get four years to probably do two. Well, I went to Lewisburg. Angelo Ruggiero went to Lewisburg. And John Gotti went to the state prison. But <laughs> while I was in Lewisburg, I was in the middle of that scene from Goodfellas. When the, the Paulie scene. guy. Yeah, when the Paulie guy was slicing the garlic. <laughs> I was in the room. <laughs> so that same summer, it was, it was just humorous. You got to remember now, we didn't have telephones in Lewisburg that year. Yeah. They came the following year, but we had a TV room. So one of the most amazing nights of our life was all the Italians in this room. And I never really talked much about it. They were talking about, oh, the president is going on tonight. Everybody thinks he's going to resign. I think it was a Wednesday night. We watch him and he resigns. Mm. And he said his famous words were, I'm not a crook. <laughs> and we did, we did one of those spot kisses all over the prison. <laughs> I'm not a crook. No, I'm not a crook. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of humor in those days. You gotta realize That's in great. that yeah, in those in that prison, Gary, there was there was um, the guy from American Gangster. What was his name again? Oh God. Oh, the black well, guy. Yeah, the black Denzel Washington played him, not uh, yeah, not, yeah. Uh, so that guy was course. there, the guy from Henry was there. Henry Hill was there, yeah. Yeah, we were all there. And the guy from uh, Bronx Tale, he was there. And I was there. All these guys who eventually made movies about. <laughs> so it was really hilarious when I think back to 74. Well, I win a case and I get out. I was supposed to do 25 years. I did like 13 months. I get out. I go back to Queens. And I met the guy from Bronx Tale. Big, fat guy, funny guy named Fat. Gigi, Louis Ingalese. He's the guy that Jazz Palmateri did the play on. Yeah. And then Louis Ingalese, funny guy, man, said, because I had the name Ubach, which meant crazy in Italian. Ubach, yeah. you better put those guns away. I go, why? You can't make much money with a gun robbing. 
I go, why? All you need is the strainer and the spoon. I go, what am I going to do with a strainer and a spoon? You're going to learn how to cut heroin. <laughs> I went back home, learned how to cut heroin, made a lot, a lot of money. Gotti was in jail. Gotti came out 77. All kinds of things happened. I made a lot, a lot of money. I spent a million dollars on a racetrack in upstate New York, mm -hmm. which went which went belly up, you know. But the point is the racetrack's still there, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, eventually I left New York City. I went back to the drug dealer and got busted. When I got busted, I had to I had to testify against a corrupt judge. And so I signed this paper. I didn't even realize what I was signing. It's like a credit card application. You better read the fine print. Yeah. I, test, I testified against the judge, Gary. And about six months later, I get a call. We're going to send you the witness protection program. Marshall says, we're going to send you to uh, somewhere in Iowa. You're going to have a meeting with a woman. I go, what woman? Her name is Diane Jackalone. Mm. I go, what is she doing? I get out there. We got a Gotti case. We just made an arrest. It was already 80. I guess it was 86. What do you want me to do? She says, you're the best storyteller in Queens. She said, I want you to be the first witness in this gaudy Rico case. Oh, geez. I didn't. I thought I was off the hook living in the program in Texas, by the way. In Texas. I was supposed to blend. I was like Cousin Vinny out there. <laughs> like the story I told you about up in my hometown. <laughs> There's no Italians within 20 miles of that little town. <laughs> right. I stuck out like a sore thumb in San Antonio. But I agreed to testify, and she put me through a lot of crap. As I was testifying, though, I'll never forget it. I'm sitting outside her office. The door is open. And she's telling this person, he cannot talk to you. He will not talk to you. I mean, even when he gets off the stand, because I was going to be on the stand seven days and he got his car, I'm going to tell him never to talk to you. Now, don't call me in again. Mm -hmm. She hangs up on this witness, uh, this reporter. I go into the, to the office. I said, who is that? Boy, you were tough on her. Oh, this overbearing reporter named Barbara Nevins, who later on won 15, she won 15, uh, 15 awards. What do you call it for television? Uh, Pulitzer. Or Emmy. No, she won. She won Emmy awards. Emmy awards. Stuff. Okay. So the next day I called that woman from ABC. <laughs> I'll give you an interview. If you give me a writer. Oh, my husband's the writer. Turned out to be Nick Taylor. Oh, so that's the guy that wrote your story. The first book. Yeah. So anyway, I testified. And as I was leaving, I go down in the basement of the Brooklyn federal courthouse and i'm looking through a two two-way window and i see four limousines back into the basement i go back up the next day i said are you kidding me did you guys sequester the jury she says no do you don't think john Gotti is going to reach one of those jurors he's going to bribe somebody she said sal you're watching too much television <laughs> and she ignored my advice of course we later know years later that Sammy had made the fix on a on a jury. Well, once John Gotti wins that case, he becomes a hero. Oh, yeah. He became a hero in New York, like a legend, you know? So I went back to the program, uh, split with my first wife, got my kids to college. They're both college football players. They're both highly educated, very successful. They never, never took a step towards crime. And I go to Hollywood around 88, 89, 90. I'm going to tell these stories. Of course, when I got there, I met a lot of credible people. Well, one woman who's funny, she was on the, she was the mother with Fran Drescher on the nanny. Mm -hmm. Her name was Renee Taylor. She told her, oh, oh, Fran, with like a nasal voice. And she goes, you know, Sal, I'm going to introduce you to a lot of people in Hollywood because you're real. You're a real Chili Palmer, she said. Chili Palmer was from the movie. Yeah. Get Shorty. Get Shorty. Yeah, well, Mobs yeah. do goes to Hollywood, you know. Yeah, you would and be Renee, the real Chili Palmer. <laughs> yeah, Palmer. And, and Renee had a great husband. His name was Joe Bologna. And he was a great teacher of screen. And he taught me how to write screenplays. And then I worked with Marduk Martin, who wrote Raging Bull and Mean Streets and New York, New York. I worked with good people. I learned the craft. But just because I learned the craft, it was one thing I didn't know about Hollywood. 
The mob yeah. ro robs you with a gun. Hollywood robs you with a pencil. You better have an attorney. They'll take every one of your scripts. But eventually I got the money, made a movie, produced it, wrote it. And then I was too old, you know, like 10 years ago. I was already in my 60s. I better get out of Hollywood. Little did I know that in this, in, in like 10, 15 years ago, nobody cared about television. Now, television is gold. Netflix. Yeah. Like gold. So I do have an agent negotiating my story. And she calls it a cross. It's a cross between The Sopranos and Friday Night Lights because mm -hmm. both my kids were super athletes. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of the stuff I did. I did invent toys. Nobody knows. And we're going to let go of the real, the real witness protection name soon and tell the story from a different point of view on what I went through. I did everything legal from 1986. I never got arrested again. I uh, had opportunities. Henry wanted me to steal stuff with him. I go, take a hike, Henry. <laughs> him and I caught up with each other in the 90s, Henry. But he was still a drug addict and still a crook. Yeah. And I walked away from that, Gary. I spoke at a lot of police conferences. And how did you break the cycle, they said? Because I didn't want to do what I did the first part of my life. So I had a second life. Then I had two beautiful kids with a second wife. Then I got those kids educated. Now they're in their 30s. And then I met a wonderful woman about eight or nine years ago, married her five, six years ago. And now we live on the desert in Arizona. Cool. Doing the good things. A lot different in the uh, gritty streets of uh, New York City. I oh, guess. my God. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, yeah. uh, tell me something. Uh, describe that scene inside the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. What, well, you know, what was that like to walk in there? Yeah. Give us a sense of, yeah. you know, what, what what kind of furnishings did they have and what how did people relate to each other? What, well, it was, was meager. Like? It was very meager. A couple little uh, chairs and tables, you know, like uh, out of a bar, nothing matched. Mostly, you know, these, these were not intellectual giants. These were mostly morons who wanted to follow a guy like John Gotti, who was pretty street smart, you know? Yeah. They didn't have any money, those guys there. And I wasn't even supposed to go in there. I got introduced into those that whole group, the Gambinos, to a guy named uh, Cataldo, who was the Colombo hitman. And everybody was just starting to mix in the 70s, but there was still wars on. Mm-hmm. And after I saw that, it was maybe the summer of 72. It was the summer of 72. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the summer of 71. I said to my friend Dominic, boy, that's a crappy place. Let's build a nice, a nice little Italian club. Uh, that's when you built the Sinatra Club, huh? Exactly. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now what, what was life like in there? And I know about, were there a lot of beautiful young girls came in there wanting to rub elbows with this kind of the, the bad boys, the dangerous bad boys? I know there's yeah. a certain group of women out there that like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they like bad boys. Well, the Sinatra Club had some, some class to it. We had catered food come in. We started out with a little tiny dollar, $2 game. Before you know, well, there was guys coming in because Gotti had gotten out of jail early 72 by mid 72 we had three different tables set up and we were doing numbers we were doing stolen merchandise then a half a block away i had a couple of fine working professional girls up in an apartment and the guys would go over there and have some time with the girls but we had mm -hmm. good food good wine and um you know the mob at that time they didn't have you know your profession you didn't have high-tech surveillance in the 70s right you know, you had to listen to a couple of informants maybe, but you didn't record things like they got to do in the 80s. Yeah. So once, uh, you know, I started to see what the government was able to do. And of course, Giuliani was really hot on the mob. Uh, and the guys started to flip because it was facing 40 year sentences, you know. Now, you as a police officer, you know, you had information out on the street. But in those days, Gary, the, the FBI did not exchange information with ATF. And right, ATF, right. Or local people. Shared. They didn't give any information out at all. They didn't share anything. Yeah. So, you know, each agency was very private. And they might have been working a drug case, but they wouldn't tell another agency like ATF or CIA or FBI, oh, we're working this guy. 
they would accidentally maybe run into him in New York City uh, in a surveillance team and yeah. all of a sudden realize somebody else surveillance. <laughs> yeah, is surveillance. Yeah. I've seen that. I've seen yeah, that. there you go. You know about how funny <laughs> yeah. that could be. So, but the technology, I think, was key. I was ready to get out of the life because they started killing for like yeah. no reason, Gary. They were killing over money. Okay. And my own, you know, my own contact, I went and met the head of the Colombo family. If you watched The Godfather, the movie Offer. Yeah, the I Offer, watched that. See that. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the Columbos were in the middle of that, that whole nightmare of approving the movie, but the rest of the families didn't want anybody to see that movie. So there was a temporary boss of the Colombo family. His name was Joe Brancato. That was after Colombo had gotten shot. So uh -huh. I was reporting to Brancato, bringing him money every couple of weeks. So I was pretty deep there. Yeah, of course, no, nobody nobody respected uh, the Columbos. The truth was nobody really, because they're always killing each other, you know? And the Gambinos had more organization, more discipline. But they were killing too. Everybody was killing and killing. It was all about the greed, yeah. a lot of greed. greed. Now, I, I guess I got, I got one more question here. Uh, when you were doing, making money off of, in the heroin trade, did yeah. did you have to keep that hidden from most of the other people around you, uh, or was that like an open secret? Uh, it was you absolutely had to be getting a lot of yeah. cash money in, and yeah, absolutely and had to be dealing secretive. with people that they didn't know. Yeah, it had to be secretive because the guy that introduced me to it, this guy Cataldo, he was actually buying the French Connection heroin. Uh huh. They were taking flour. They had cops that were going to get the evidence out. Switch out the heroin to flour and put the flour back in the property clerk's office. Uh, so, so you were getting locker. a piece of that. You were getting a piece of that French connection heroin that hit the streets, right? But didn't nobody admitted it? But we got it, and it was you know because pure heroin stays pure forever. Yeah, I mean it doesn't go bad; it doesn't evaporate. But the heroin business was big because of guys like Frank Lucas, American gangster, guys yeah. like Lee. Uh, what's the name? Bur um, what was the name again? Bar, uh, Barnes, Burns, whatever his name, or Leroy, Leroy Barnes, I think. Leroy, they were big. Yeah. Nicky, Nicky Barnes. Nicky, Nicky Leroy Barnes. Barnes, yeah. They were big, big drug dealers, you know, and that's how people made a lot of money. In that business. Yeah. Actually, they're the ones that, that then uh, Angelo Rogerio and that Mark Reitler, writer, uh, they, yeah. were, they got to yeah. dealing with yeah. blacks, with Barnes and, and yeah. one of them, and their <laughs> wife ratted yeah. them out. So Mark much. Mark Ryder was a good friend of mine. Oh, really? Yeah, we were yeah. good friends. Oh, yeah. Mark was a, a really nice guy. I knew his wife and his kids. His kids played football for me. I was a football coach. Uh, and the ironic part recently was my co-writer, Steve Dowdy. I started to tell him that, you know, a lot of guys got their kids involved in the mob and they're dead. I go, Frankie Burke, Jimmy Burke's son, dead. Oh, Mark really? Ryder, his son, dead. Okay. Many, many sons dead because they followed their dad's footsteps. Hmm. How, how terrible was that? Right. And if you dig some research, Gary, you'll find out that I believe Sammy the Bull, I believe it was actually, you know, uh, what was his name? The Odd the odd Father. His name was Vincent Giganti. Someone went to him and Vincent. said, oh, you know what? Oh, John Gotti Jr. became a member. And Shiganti's response was, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. No yeah. made guy should bring his son into the family. That's how bad even the bosses looked at the life. It wasn't glamorous anymore. Uh-huh. And, and John John Gotti Jr. got made and they called him the dumb fella. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> well, that kind of tells you what a low life John Gotti Senior was that he couldn't help make a life for his son outside of that uh, anyhow yeah he wasn't really i'll tell you something he always had an ego in the beginning and he wasn't really a, a megalomaniac in the beginning in the 70s but once once he pulled off that murder of the mcbratney guy Bratney, yeah it became the favorite son of gambino because gambino was still alive that's right. He he did that for Gambino. That guy had right. killed Gambino's son, I believe, or nephew or something. Nephew, nephew man, nephew. Manny Gambino, nephew. Yeah. yeah. So then John goes to prison. By the time John gets out of prison, 
Gambino's dead and Castellano, who the street guys never liked Castellano because he was an Ivy League type of mobster, you know. And uh, Gotti hated Castellano. And there was yeah. so many things that happened there that caused that whole Gambino family, you know, to fall. I mean, really, uh, the, the wiretaps and all kinds of things were, was, get, you know, getting thrown at the mob because they couldn't handle it. But yeah. I will tell you this about Jack alone. That was 1986, that case. If people look deep into it, the FBI never made the case against John Gotti. She accidentally got that case through a hijacking, through an armored car heist. And Jack alone was overmatched mm -hmm. be between, uh, between my old attorney, the guy just died. His name was uh, 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 Jerry Shargell. And uh, and the guy that Gotti had, the guy with the bald head. Oh, oh God, yeah, but, Bruce Cutler. Yeah, between those two and another guy, they were classy attorneys, and they yeah. beat her down. They beat her down, so she had no chance. Well, it happens. So, Sal, I really appreciate you coming on. I promised you I wouldn't keep you very long. And folks, here's what we got. This is just a little tune-up. Uh, Sal's going to come back because. Tell them a little bit about you're doing something with Netflix along the vein of, and you work with them on Fear City, which was a yeah. look at the commission trial. So you've got something coming up in yeah. the future, and we're going to get back together and yeah. we'll do a video and we'll do, we'll, yeah. we'll really go into depth about what you're going to talk about there. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, Netflix uh, hired a company out of London. And about oh, almost a year ago, they called me and said, would you be interested in an interview? I said, look, I'm, I'm not doing interviews anymore unless I get paid good money. <laughs> they said, really? Uh, yeah. Well, I so, appreciate you doing this for free. <laughs> well, we, we negotiated a trip. <laughs> My wife and I, we took a trip across the country. They put us up in a nice hotel. And I gave them eight hours of uninterrupted interview. Wow. And I told them I wouldn't, you know, let out all the, all the new stuff because there were a lot of stuff that I kept secret anyway. And it's not about murders because see, I never murdered anybody. I wasn't interested. Not that I couldn't do it, Gary. Yeah, I yeah. wouldn't do it. It was against my grain. So I went up there to New York. My wife was sitting there, and these young gals, producers, were asking me questions for eight hours, and I gave them really good stuff. And what was funny was, I said to them before I got there, "Now, what is this for?" Netflix, Fear City 2. I go, what's the difference between one and two? Well, Fear City 1 is about the law enforcement POV. Yeah, okay. it was. We want another angle. Well, I'll give you another angle. I'll give you the real deal of what went on back there in the 70s and the 80s. So I sat in a restaurant, and they interviewed me for eight hours. And I said, I want to tell you, before we get there, I have this amazing memory for 1972. I don't know why it stuck with me. I'll give you conversations I had, which were funny conversations, but, you know, pivotal ones with Gotti and the whole life. Little did I know it was changing rapidly. I mean, really changing. In a couple of years, everything changed. So I gave them those, those I gave them that time. They got good stuff. And, you know, eventually when it comes on, you know, I'll know when it's going to come on. They were very secretive about these interviews they did. It was so funny because one day I said to them, uh, are you interviewing a guy that named uh, Anthony Ruggiano? They said, what? <laughs> are you interviewing Anthony Ruggiano? Well, Anthony happened to be a little bit younger than me when he was a kid. It was only like six houses away. And his father was a hitman called Fat Andy Ruggiano. Yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. And so Anthony, they, they did an interview with Anthony. And they called me afterwards. Well, how did you know we were going to interview Anthony? I go, the birds of a feather flock together. I knew you were going to. And Anthony was a cool kid. He was a kid. He was young, you know. And uh, it was just funny. We'd come in my deli. I had a little deli on the block. And I guess he's now speaking out against crime and, and the mob. Not, you know, not like Sammy. Sammy's gloating over what he did. Well, that's yeah. great. That's what, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to gloat over the life. I mean, I could tell the story with energy and say, I thought it was the sweetest thing since seven up paying <laughs> off cops, paying off, you know, political people. But in the long term, it was the wrong thing to do. And I taught my sons never to do that. And they never did. 
They're college educated. So, you know, I knew where I was going. I just didn't know exactly how I was going to get there, Gary. Yeah, I understand. Well, you've had quite a life, Sal. And, and yeah. uh, I just want to tell you, I really appreciate it. And, and my regular listeners, I got this cadre of regular people that, cool. that listen to me all the time yeah. that I talk to yeah. once in a while. Yeah. I even have a, a, a do a Zoom call with the, the guys that really support me uh, uh, once a month. And, and so we all really appreciate that you came good, on and, good. and talked to us. And, and I look forward to uh, yeah. talking to you again when this Netflix thing comes out and cool. going a little more in depth. I will tell you one thing that uh, sticks with me, like recently, I'm disappointed with the country, the way they've tried to excommunicate, the way they've tried to separate police from our society. That really bothers me. So yeah. if I had a chance to speak in front of a bunch of police officers after being almost 40 years in the life of crime, I would tell them how much I appreciate their job and how valuable they are instead of being put against the wall and yeah. you know, always. I mean, it's it's really rough the condition that the country's it in. Is. That, yeah. that bothers me. And it you is. being a police officer, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. I know it, it's it's tough right now. It's really tough. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it, you know, it's something that you just get used to after a while. And, and yeah, you know, I don't know. It's it, it the pendulum swings. It always swings. It has yeah. swung a couple yeah. of times over the last thirty years. Right. And since the the really since the 1968. And we had a lot of riots in the country and, and everything yeah. started changing then the pendulum yeah. one way. And then people right, get right. scared during the crack epidemic. They got right. scared. And, and I'm going to tell you something, Sal, you could get away with almost anything out there in the community during the crack. If you're right. working on a crack house, you know, yeah. nobody cared. <laughs> they just right. wanted that right. crack house gone. But then yeah. pretty soon yeah. that is gone and you right. know, and it swings back. So, you know, please yeah. just have to learn to swing with the times. It's the only thing I can say. Yeah. It's, it's a fun job. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything, but I don't know if I could do it now. Right. No, <laughs> Plus, different, there's different no world. organized crime to work on now. I don't know what you do. You have to work on, uh, uh, Mexican cartels, I guess, if you want to get into <laughs> the big boys. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, I didn't think I was going to be a part of history because that whole time is gone. Yeah, you know, it really is gone. And yeah. I don't want to tell stories like Sammy. I like Michael. Michael is more of a realist. If you ever listen to him, he's yeah, very real. I Michael, have, yeah, he is. He, I like he, him a lot. He, he's more like a regular guy. It's like he's yeah. one of those guys that I often I've talked to a few of you guys. Yeah. Like you should have just put all that ingenuity and intelligence and leadership ability and charisma to work in the legitimate business. And you would have been succ more successful, probably. Yeah, He's one of yeah. those guys. Yeah. Yeah. I spent a couple of days with him. They did a, oh, we did a, I want to say a series from like 10 years ago, I think it was the making of the mob or something. Oh, and yeah, they took us, they took us to Philadelphia. They took us to Boston yeah. and we rode around a limousine together and we laughed because he's a little younger than me. But, you know, when Colombo got murdered, he was right there on the scene. He was a young kid. So he, he remembered that. You know, I think he's your age. Are you 68? Yeah, uh, I'm 76, man. <laughs> oh, 76. All I'm right. getting old. <laughs> All right. Me too. <laughs> All right. So All right. Well, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. All right. Thanks, Gary. And I look forward to talking to you again. All right. Thanks. We weren't actually going after Gotti. We were actually prosecuting a series of hijacking cases and armored car robberies. But over time, we found that he and his crew were controlling an awful lot of crime in New York City, all over New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, we decided to take it apart. We decided to take the entire crew apart, not just from the top, but all the way through the ranks. All right, I want to take a look at a clip. And we're <laughs> Which is the other real irony in this, because you grew up in the same neighborhood. I did. I grew up in Queens out in Richmond Hill, Ozone Park, and saw, saw the kinds of seductions that went on, the corruption of young people that went on. And the social club, the so-called social club, is right next to... It's close, it's close to a school I went to. It's yeah. next to the church that we went to. 